So, um, so far uh, in our one big story, uh, we have made three stops. Tonight's our fourth um, along the way. So we began in Eden, where we saw everything created perfectly by God, uh, but then humanity choosing not to listen to God, to do their own thing, and allowing sin into the world. Um, at Babel, we saw the, what sin does. So people came together uh, and wanted to build a tower to reach to heaven, not because they wanted to be close to God, but because they wanted to be like God and they wanted to make a name for themselves. So uh, God scattered the people and confused their language to protect them from the consequences of sin. And then last time we were together, uh, people came back together, God's people at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God spoke to them, um, showing them a little glimpse into what life is meant to be like. Um, so we thought about the importance of listening to God's voice, obeying his word, uh, and also the danger of having idols. So the danger of not listening to God and listening to other things. Tonight, uh, we're going to head to um, Jerusalem um, and we're going to see how the promise that God made at the very beginning, uh, that he is going to do something about sin and death, how that promise um, continues. But I want to begin with a question, so if you've got your phone, uh, open up Slido or head to slido.com. And exciting news this week, Slido have updated it and can, you can now include it in a PowerPoint so I don't have to flick between my laptop and back. Uh, so here's the question, there's the code as well. So it's hashtag L764 and my question to begin with is what is the longest journey that you've ever made? And I'm just going to see in quick time what your answers are and we'll have a bit of a chat about it. So what's the longest journey you've ever made? And if you're not sure, you can have a guess. Okay, so we've got one into India. Lol. I think that's a lot of It could be a lot of love for, for India. Um, so that was, how long was that journey? How long it took or how distance wise? Well, no, how long did it take, like time wise? One, thirty-two hours. I mean, it's really stopped in London. Yeah, it would have been at least 30 hours. That is a long time. <laughs> uh, let's see, we've got Tenerife. Nice. Uh, driving to Portugal. Who drove to Portugal, Italy? Driving to Portugal? Oof. Yeah, yeah. How long did that take? Like, four days. Oh, wow. Four days. Fair play. Uh, North Carolina, 24 hours of travel. I'm guessing that was Amy. Yeah. Uh, nice one. Uh, Kanya. Love that. <laughs> uh, how far away is Kenya? It's like four hours. Four hours. Australia's a long one. Who's been to Australia? Oh. Uh, Canada. It was Canada. Oh, nice. Uh, Dublin. <laughs> Dublin. Dublin. Love a bit of Dublin. And Florida. Is it, oh, Scotland. That's okay. Uh, so, yeah, there's some, some long ones in there in Vienna. These are classy places. We are a well traveled bunch. Um, France as well. Nice. Um, so, the reason why I start with that question is because uh, to move from Sinai to Jerusalem, you have to cover an awful lot of ground. It is a long distance. Uh, and so before we get to Jerusalem, there's a few places we need to stop on the way so that we don't miss out on the big picture of the Bible. Uh, but further than that, I've got two videos to show you. The first one is all about a, a long journey and travel. So this is a guy who took a year to travel the world and he's put all of his highlights into 60 seconds. So I will warn you, it, when you watch this, sometimes it can put you in a daze, slightly hypnotise you, or you may feel like you need to like lie down. Uh, but it's classic. Everywhere you went to, he puts it in a picture in 60 seconds. And then the second video I'm going to show you is an Irish guy who went, uh, I think, to America and did not realise the whole time that his GoPro was the wrong way around. 
Uh, so I'll show you. I'll show you this one first. Oh, that's <laughs> definitely see two of the girls going, does he know that that's not in the right direction? But yeah, he went to the Grand Canyon and everything. Oh, <laughs> oh I feel so bad for him. Uh, but the reason why I share that is because we don't want to miss stuff that's really important. So here's a quick stop tour on some of the steps that we're going to take to get to Jerusalem. So first one takes us to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, and in Deuteronomy, here's what we learn. Uh, this is a book that tells us, especially in chapters 1 to 3, um, about the 40 years that God's people wandered in the desert as a result of their sin. So God was sending them to the promised land, but because of their sin, it took them way longer to get there than there should have been because God had to try and teach them the lesson that they needed to obey him, they needed to listen to him. Uh, and we also find the recording of Moses' final message to the people as they're on the edge of the promised land. So Moses died before they ever got there uh, and it records his last message to God's people as they, they're about to kind of take hold of God's promise of the new land. So that's Deuteronomy. Um, next up is the book of Joshua and this book records the invasion of the promised land. So it wasn't just there waiting for them, they had to defeat some people um, in order to settle in the land. Um, uh, and so they defeat people, they set on the promised land, and that's what Joshua tells us about. Next up is the book of Judges, uh, and you see the little tag on there, wicked people, but a gracious God. So God's people continue to struggle with sin, and um, there's a lot of bad stuff that you read about in the book of Judges, but it tells us about how, uh, because of their sin, God had to raise up anointed leaders to, to help rule these people, to try and point them uh, to God, and so he, he raises up these people called the judges. And then finally, uh, we go to 1 Samuel, um, where in this book we see God's people asking for a king, even though God is their leader, God is the king of kings, they say basically, God, we don't want you to rule us, we want the king just like everybody else. So again, you see sin there, they want to be like everybody else that they see in the world. So they ask for a king, God anoints Saul, and then Second to Saul, we have David, and David is the king who eventually leads God's people to conquer Jerusalem um, and to take it over. So those are kind of really important steps uh, along this journey until we finally get to the city of Jerusalem 
And Jerusalem became hugely important uh, for God's people. It's all over the Bible. Uh, it's mentioned because it's really important. Uh, and this is why it's celebrated so much in, a, in the book of the Psalms. So the Psalms refers to Jerusalem a lot, especially Psalms 120 to 134, which are known as the Psalms of Ascent or the Songs of Ascent. So Psalms 120 to 134 are songs that people would sing or they would memorize so, while they were on their way up to Jerusalem, on the way to the temple. Um, now, uh, lots of time, an ascent is basically moving upwards, and these are songs that you sing on the way up to Jerusalem, not because Jerusalem is like on the top of a hill or really high uh, with regards to the land. It's a term that they use because of its importance. Um, so it's a bit like sometimes I say, um, oh, I'm going to go up to see my parents. Now, I'm, I'm not actually going up to see my parents. Sometimes I'm kind of like going downhill a little bit. But it's a sign of like importance that the people I'm going to see is important. When the psalmist says that they're going up to Jerusalem, it's a signal signal to us that Jerusalem is a really important place. Uh, Christopher Ash says this. He says, in Old Testament terms, you could start your journey on the top of Mount Everest, but if you were going to Jerusalem, you had to go up. It was the most important place on earth. So this place uh, that we're stopping at tonight is super important when it comes to the story. Of the Bible. Uh, and we're going to focus in on a psalm, Psalm 122, uh, one of these psalms of a saint that tells us a little bit about Jerusalem uh, and the kind of place that it was, a place of peace. Uh, but it's interesting to kind of note the little journey that we take on the way to this place in Psalm 122. So Psalm 120 tells us all about the distress and the misery of living in a broken world. So this is a psalm all about just sin and the consequences of sin. It's destroyed people, it's destroyed lands, and it's really bad. And the psalmist is really honest about how difficult it is to be in a world full of sin and people who are enemies of God. Then we take a step up and we go to Psalm 121, uh, where the psalmist, even though he's in a really difficult place, looks up to the hills and he realizes that God is there, God is in Jerusalem, and so that's where his help comes from. So he calls out to God for help. And then the next step is Psalm 122, and this is the beginning of the journey to the house of God, the beginning of the journey to Jerusalem. So uh, we're going to read that psalm together. So if you if you have your Bible, if you have your phone, and you want to open that up as we read along, we're going to go to Psalm uh, 122 and to the house of the Lord. So I'm going to flick that up. Psalm 122, it's only nine verses, uh, but here's what it says. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Psalm 122 ends there. So it's a short psalm, but it tells us quite a lot about this city and about its importance to God's people. Um, so we're just going to simply look at four images that this psalm gives us tonight and four images that help us to understand a little bit about Jerusalem but also how it points us forward to, to heaven uh, and to what paradise will be like in the new Jerusalem. So here's the first image that we see as we look at this psalm together. The first image is of a house and this house is all about access. So Jerusalem is a place where we can access God it begins and ends by mentioning the house of the Lord, which is reference to the temple where God lived, or at least that's what people back then understood. So when you talked about the temple, the idea you had in your head was, well, that's where God, that's where God is present, that's where he exists. Uh, it symbolized God's presence on earth. And if you go back to Exodus 25 to 40, you see that in between Sinai, uh, the place where we were last time, and Jerusalem, 
as pe God's people wandered through the desert, um, they actually had a place where they believed God existed on earth, and it was the tabernacle. If you do RE uh, in school, I think we pretty much cover this. Um, but the tabernacle, the tent, went along with God's people through the wilderness, and they believed that this is the place where we can meet with God. And in that tabernacle, there was something called the Ark of the Covenant. And inside that box were two stone tablets which contained the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so the Ark was pictured, it's referred to in loads in the Bible as the footstool of God. So the Ark was seen as the place where God put his feet, which meant wherever the Ark was, that's where God's presence was. And so that's why it was inside the tabernacle. Um, and when we think about the, the tabernacle, when we think about the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence being there, it should take us back actually to Eden. Because in Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve, he walked with people. And so in the Ark of the Covenant, in the tabernacle, they believed that God was walking with them. The garden, garden was entered from the east and was guarded by cherubim. And the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, was entered by the east. And you can see in the picture there, the angels, the cherubim, that kind of stood over um, God's presence. And then in the Garden of Eden, um, there was a, a, a river that gave life to all around it. Um, and in Ezekiel, who has a vision of the temple, um, he sees a, a river that flows from the temple that gives life to everyone. So the idea is that in Jerusalem, God is present, and because God is there, well, there is life to be found. Another important aspect of the temple, though, was that it was the place of sacrifice. You see, God may have been there, but because of sin, people couldn't just get access to God any way they want it. The only way to come to God was through an animal sacrifice. And the only person that could offer that sacrifice was the priest. Now here's what Christopher Rice says. He says, the psalmist is amazed to stand within the gates of the city where God lives. He knows that he doesn't deserve it. No one deserves it. He stands there by grace. He feels the wonder of the presence of God in the city of peace. This is the place that God loves. So when we think about the temple, well, we need to think about the fact that in order for us to come into God's presence, there had to be a sacrifice. Only the priest could do it, and only once a year could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies and actually be in God's presence. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to see uh, that Jesus in the Bible is referred to as our great high priest. So what, what we're seeing there is the fact that because of what Jesus has done, we have unlimited access into God's presence. We don't have to offer anything because Jesus has offered himself as that sacrifice. So that's the first image as you think about Jerusalem as a house that shows us that we can come into God's presence. The second picture is a city and this city is all about security. Uh, but I've got another question so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about this uh, and to type in your answer. Uh, and here's what the question is. What is one of the busiest cities that you have ever been in? What's one of the busiest cities you've ever been in? I'll play a little bit of music. I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a think. And then we'll see what some of your answers are. Have you been in Rome? Oh, some of these answers are great. Who was, who was in Rome when the Pope made an appearance? Unbelievable. Was That's it just crazy? Yeah, like we didn't realise. Um, so we walked into the wagon. like in middle <laughs> <laughs> Love that. He was chatting away in Latin, so he didn't know what he was talking about. Love that. Whoever said a hawk was an absolute legend. Love <laughs> uh, Who's been to, what was the other one I saw? Um, who's been to Cluj? Cluj is in Romania, yeah, I thought so. Um, how busy was it? It was mad. Like, so we went to the shop, but you literally were standing for about an hour to get into each of them. So oh, we ended up going to we were gonna go to a water park but then half the team forgot their sunset so there either. Uh, a few saw a few Londons, uh, some New Yorks for people that have been there. Uh, well one of the reasons why um, God's people would travel to Jerusalem was because that's the that's the city we went to to have any kind of legal business that you had attended to. So this is the place um, where Oh no, sorry, I've gone to the wrong page. Uh, cities is where I was thinking of. I, I was going to share with you three of the busiest cities I've ever been to. And I've got some pictures of them. The first one uh, was in Vietnam. 
um, and it was just the maddest place I've ever been to. It's one of those places where you literally have to walk into oncoming traffic or you will not get across the road. Like you, you don't stand and wait for there to be no traffic because it never comes. So you, you just walk and people drive around you. Uh, you've been there, Chris, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, it's the weirdest place ever. Uh, it, you have to like forget everything your parents told you about the Green Cross Code. You just have to walk into traffic. Uh, so that's how busy this place was. Uh, next place, uh, Times Square in New York. Um, it's just the maddest place I've ever been to. The only reason I didn't get lost because I was with my friend who is a six foot ginger. So I just kept looking for <laughs> the ginger. I'm so glad he was there. Um, and then finally, uh, in Toronto, in Canada, you're just swamped with skyscrapers everywhere. So it's a really busy place with really big buildings and you just feel like totally enclosed and compact. Uh, and that's the description that we get here of Jerusalem. Here's what the Psalm says. Jerusalem is built as a city that is bound firmly together. So they're not saying that it's a really busy city. They're not saying it's a really, really tall buildings. But actually that kind of being built firm together is a sign that it's a secure place. So it's kind of fortified, it's defensive, it's hard to, to get into, it's a safe place to be. Um, in, in his book, Christopher Ash mentions a news story um, about Japan, uh, which I find really interesting. So um, I discovered that Japan is one of the top 10 countries that's most prone to earthquakes. If you didn't know that, you can impress your geography teacher. Uh, Japan is in what they call the Pacific Ring of Fire. So basically, I'm not going to get all technical, but there's a lot of tectonic plates at play um, and they come together quite a lot, meaning that anything within that kind of wing is in danger of earthquakes. So Japan is one of those places that is always in danger of earthquakes. So for that reason, they have to build buildings a certain way so that if an earthquake comes, uh, the building's been set up to kind of withstand um, as much of the damage as possible. So, uh, in 2018, there was a big scandal thanks to KYB Architects in Japan uh, because they had built buildings, including structures that were going to be used for this year's Olympics, and they'd falsified the documents. So, they'd said that they put all the safety measures into place, but actually, they hadn't done the work. They hadn't spent the money making sure that they were earthquake-proof. And so what all these amazing buildings that had been built for the Olympics, everybody looked at them and thought, these are incredible, they're so safe. But actually, at the core, they weren't safe at all. Uh, if an earthquake had come, that building was more than likely uh, to topple or to be damaged severely. Um, and that reminds me just of that story that we all learn, uh, kind of growing up uh, in church, of the wise and the foolish builders. Uh, we need to have a strong foundation because if we're built on a weak foundation, when life gets difficult, well, we're in danger of kind of just falling apart. We're in danger of collapsing. If we, want to, if we want to make sure that when trials come, when struggles come, that we stand strong, well, then our foundation has to be on God. And that's why Jerusalem was seen as the safest place, because this is the place where God is. Uh, in fact, uh, you see uh, in Psalm 125, verse 1, it says this, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, and Jerusalem is, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. So this is a place where God is, and because God is there, this is a place that is safe. Third image is the image of a tribe, um, and this is all about harmony and togetherness. The journey between Sinai and Jerusalem was not an easy journey for God's people. It had a very rocky uh, time. Uh, we actually find, as you read um, through what happens with God's people, that they go from being one people uh, to fighting with each other so much that they end up splitting into 12 tribes. Um, so God's people, they're kind of just summed up with not getting on, hostility, fighting, arguments, not being together. But yet the one place where they always do unite and come together um, is at Jerusalem. It's when they come to worship God at the temple. Again, Christopher says this, he says, there are actually only two options for human society, true worship and war. Only true worship humbles human pride. And what he's saying there is that left, left on our own, we will always find ways to fall out with each other. That's, that's what sin does. Uh, we cannot keep things together on our own. The only thing that allows us to come together is to look up 
to God. Instead of looking at ourselves, we're called to worship him. Because as we do that, well, we realize that all of us are on an equal playing field. We've all been made by God with one purpose, and that is to follow him and to give him glory. Uh, and so Jerusalem is a place where people who are not united come together and are united because their eyes are lifted away from themselves and are lifted to God. And finally, uh, one last picture uh, is the picture of a throne. Uh, and this is all about government and being ruled and led. Uh, so I've got one last question. This one I imagine is going to be much more fun. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go over a little bit tonight, but just to finish things off, here's the next question. What is one law that you wish existed? So if, you, if I gave you the power tonight to make up one law, what law would you create? Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your answers. So I'll give you a minute or two to come up with your law. Four day a week, nice. Was that your score? <laughs> No 45 limit, oh, limit for our game was quite good. <laughs> well, it's good if you get onto the motorway. No. <laughs> Everybody has the right to 10 free holidays. I'd love to dig into that. Is that like every year or just in a lifetime? In a lifetime. Well, that's good. 10 free holidays. This is all very dangerous. Yeah. No more third map for our speed limits. Do you want them higher or lower? No, I disagree. I would say most people have some I'll give you 30 more seconds if you want to say anything. Oh, that's what I was going at. Autobahn. What is the speed limit on the Autobahn? There is a bike. What? So it's just a free for all? That's not bad. Um, it's bad to able to buy a new petrol and diesel cars in 2030. So, I feel like that was definitely Matthew Ryan or Scott. You're able to buy petrol or diesel cars in 2030? No, that wasn't. I'm going to say the first one. Congratulations. Hey, no, Well, there's the other one. So, I mean, thankfully, none of you have the power to make some of you. Oh, I mean, the 10 free holidays is an epic idea, I'm up for that. Uh, but um, laws are really important, and that's the last image of Jerusalem because it's the place where people dealt with um, issues concerning law and rules. It was a place where the judges would be, and so you would come to them with your issues and they would sort them out for you. Um, if there was a good king, well, then the judge would rule fairly uh, and with justice because they would follow the lead of the king. If there was a bad king, the judges were not very good because they followed the lead of the king and often um, things would be unfair. Which is why the good news for us is that uh, Jesus is the ultimate judge. Jesus is the ultimate king. He is someone who is always good, always fair, always just. And so uh, we can expect that what God does is always for our good and for our best. And in the end, justice will always be done. Um, Jerusalem is the place where God's anointed one, God's king, God's Messiah, Jesus, rules and he rules with justice. And this is good news because we as people, we need someone to rule us. We need someone to tell us what to do because on our own, we really do mess things up. Uh, if you don't believe me, look at what we read in Judges 21 and 25. It says, in those days, Israel had no king Everyone did as they saw fit. And this is the book that people described as showing us just how wicked people can be. When there's no one to tell us how things are meant to be, we make a real mess. We need a king, and thankfully we have that king. We have Jesus. But as we uh, finish um, thinking about Jerusalem, as we have those images in our mind, a place where we can access God, a house, uh, as we think about the throne, the place where God rules in justice, as we think about tribes and the idea that we come together when we worship God. And um, all of those images, sounds pretty good. Jerusalem sounds like a great place. 
But actually, um, if we were to go back to Jerusalem um, in biblical times, what we'd find would not be so good. Here's what Isaiah says when he looks at this city in Jerusalem. He says, God looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard cries of distress. Actually, Jerusalem wasn't anything like it should have been. Instead of justice, there was bloodshed. Things were going wrong. And so when we think about Jerusalem, well, we need to see that this is just a glimpse for us into something way better. The Bible tells us that one day there will be a new Jerusalem, a new city of hope, um, and it will be where we go. This is, this is heaven. This is what the Bible talks about as paradise. This new Jerusalem, this place where God is, where we will walk with God, where things will be um, perfect, there will be no sin, everything will be just and good. Um, this is what we kind of wait for, and this is what we can look forward to uh, if we are a Christian and if we put our trust in Jesus. Christopher says, Jesus is the place where we meet God, the place where we are secure, the place where squabbling people can unite, and the place where God's King rules on earth. This is what Jesus has won for us on the cross. And so when we put our trust in him, this is what we have to look forward to. And I know Mark was talking about that um, this morning. But as we finish, here's, here's the challenge for us this week. Here's the application. Because as the church, as the body of Christ, we're actually meant to, to show this to the people in, around us. We're meant to show this to our community. We're meant to be people that are united and together. We're supposed to be a place where people can come and they can feel secure and they can feel safe. Uh, we're supposed to be a place that points up to Jesus and away from ourselves to show people that if you want life at its best, if you want to find forgiveness for sins, well, Jesus is the way that you do that. And so that's why um, a local church that expresses, albeit partially and imperfectly, something of what Jerusalem promised in the Old Testament will be God's instrument for remaking a broken world. We can, we can be a part of what God wants to do. We can be a part of him remaking broken world, but also remaking broken lives. As we, as we follow him and as we aim to show other people what it is that he has done for us. And one day, all things will be made new. This is the place that we can look forward to being in, a new Jerusalem, a city where we get to be with God. And what an amazing place that will be. So the big challenge for us this week is how can we show people what Jerusalem is going to look like? How can we show people who God is and what he's done for them in the way that we act towards each other? but towards them as well. Let's ask for his help to do that as we finish tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you um, for this time tonight to look at Psalm 122. And God, there's just so much in there uh, for us to learn. But God, most of all, we pray that you would help us tonight to, to stop looking within and to look upwards to you. And God, when we look at you, well, we thank you that Jesus granted us access. That means that you are by our side anytime. Whenever things are good or whenever we fall and we need help, God, you're there for us. We thank you that you are a place of safety and security. And thank you that you protect us even when things around us seem so all over the place and so messy. We thank you, God, that you rule with justice and fairness and goodness. And we thank you, God, that you unite people. Pray that this week, God, you would help us to, to live this out, to live out what Jerusalem was so uh, known for uh, and to show people, God, uh, just the amazing love that you have for them and the life uh, that you're able to give them. We thank you that we can look forward to the new Jerusalem if we are trusting in you. And we pray, God, that, that we would be mindful of that each day when we wake up, that that would give us joy, that that would give us great peace um, as we head into each day. Oh, thank you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.